Hello and welcome everybody to today's launch of the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre, Employment and Disability in Australia, Improving Employment Outcomes for People with Disability Report. I can see that we've got quite a few people already online and more will be coming in as we just go through some opening parts of our session today. So my name is Samantha Jenkinson and I'm the host of today's event. I'm a white woman in my 50s with very short, cropped copper hair. Uh, but that, that's what the packet says, so I know it's definitely copper. And red rimmed glasses with a nose ring. I use she and I can't see today, but I also use a wheelchair um, for my mobility. I've been advocating and working in the disability sector locally and nationally for about 30 years. And this issue of the increasing or trying to get the increasing employment of people with disability in Australia is one that I have kept coming back to and there's been, been very little change over that time. But before we get started into the detail today, I'd like to introduce Emeritus Professor Simon Forrest, who's a Wajak Noongar Elder and Curtin University Fellow, who will now deliver the welcome to country. Kaya. Kaya Wanju, hello and welcome. Aging and carers. We find I'm a Wajak Baladong Noongar with kin connections to Yamaji and Wongai peoples. I am of this land and place. I follow a bloodline of people who have walked and cared for this land for over 40,000 years. This is a welcome to country, a welcome to Wajak Noongar Buja. A welcome to country recognises and acknowledges us and the first and continuing custodians of this land, Australia. Nidjabolo, Nidjakungungap, Nidjamaragarap, Nidjamindarap. Kaya, Kaya Wanju, Nan Quell, Simon Forest, Burungu. Kaya Wanju, Nidjawajak, Nunga Buja, Nal Karich, Nunga Mord, Ken Karat, Nidjabuja. Nan Karich, Nunga Kabali, Borankorie. Hello again, uh, this is Samantha speaking, and for those who've just joined us, welcome to the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre Employment and Disability in Australia National Online Launch. For anyone requiring live captions, this is just a reminder that you can go to your meeting controls and at the top of the screen select more language and speech and turn on live captions. I'd like to thank Simon Forrest for his very moving welcome to country. I'm privileged to be on Noongar country myself and I get to see this beautiful land that you've witnessed in that video every day. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging for the owners and custodians of this land. Today's event is a special occasion. Despite growing demand for workers and skills in Australia, there remain significant barriers to employment for many of the one in six Australians, that's around 4.4 million people with a disability in Australia. Aside from the obvious underutilisation of the talents of people with disability, the opportunity to work is fundamental to living a complete and fulfilling life and to achieving autonomy and independence. There have been campaigns programs over many years with no real shift in the numbers of people with disability with ongoing work. This new report contains a comprehensive assessment of the trends, drivers and consequences of labour market disadvantage faced by people with disability. 
with a view to highlighting the potential for policy and actions to promote greater inclusion and support to reduce barriers to employment and address the discrimination and unconscious bias that still endures in our society. And many of the findings really resonated with me as someone who's worked in the sector and on this topic for a number of years. I'd like to start by just running quickly through the agenda and our, our presenters today. So today's program, we have a feature of the presentation of the research findings by the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre, followed by a panel discussion with some audience Q&A. This is where you'll get the chance to have your questions answered by our expert panel. We'll start proceedings off with some opening remarks from Roger Williams, the Chief Information Officer from Bankwest. And this will be followed by a presentation of the research findings from Professor Alan Duncan, Director, and Professor Mike Doherty, Dockery, sorry, Principal Research Fellow, both from the Bankwest Curtin Public Centre. And for our panel and Q&A, we've got uh, a fantastic group of people. We have Anika Bolt from the communications, uh, who's the communications coordinator, sorry, from the Youth Disability Advocacy Network. We have Michelle Silver, from, who's the advisory council chairperson from Developmental Disability WA. Siobhan Turney, who's the director of includability from the Australian Human Rights Commission and Jeff Trapper, the disability lead with the Woolworths Group, um, as well on the panel. And we'll also be joined by Mike. Just a reminder that any time during today's live stream, you can send your questions for the panel Q&A using the Q&A box on your device. If you look for the question mark box at the um, top panel of your Teams on your device, you'll be able to find it there. You can remain anonymous by ticking the anonymous box if you wish. People have that set up. Um, but if you do have a question for a specific panel member when we come to that, you can say this is a question for Michelle or this is a question for Jeff when you type in your question. We also do have some social media hashtags for today's event, which you'll see on the slides as well. So if you are using X or LinkedIn, when you want to talk about this event, you can use the hashtag BCEC, Employment Disability, and you'll notice that we're using camel case there, which is where you use the capital letter for the beginning of each word when you use your hashtag. And you can tag the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre via at Bankwest Curtin. So let's get started with the event. And please welcome Roger Williams, the Chief Information Officer from Bankwest, for his introductory remarks. Over to you, Roger. Thank you, Samantha. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional Australians of the land in which I am on today, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And with today's event being accessible across Australia, I extend that respect to all First Nations peoples and their enduring connection to land, sea, and community. I'd like to welcome you to this new focus on the state's report, looking into the critical issue of disability employment across Australia. My name is Roger Williams. I'm the Chief Information Officer at Bank West. I'm a white 51-year-old male. Some say I look 10 years long, younger. I have fair complexion and a fair hair with a few grey flecks in it. It's a pleasure to join you today. Bank West has been part of the fabric of Western Australia for 129 years, and today, we're evolving to become a simple, easy bank for current and future homeowners nationwide. Mm -hmm. To achieve this, we recently announced our transition to, in 2024 to a digital bank, accelerating our investment in delivering digital and broker services to meet the needs of more homeowners across Australia. Our partnership with Curtin University to support the Bank West Curtin Economic Centre is another critical investment of ours, and it's a central pillar in the continued commitment of Bank West to the communities in which we live and work. The centre is already in its second decade of producing critical social and economic insights that inform and shape the debate on key issues impacting WA and the nation. During this time, it's grown to become a highly respected and nation-leading economic research centre. 
today's report is another example of the insights that underpin that reputation. About one in six Australians, which is about 4.4 million people, are living with a disability of some form. That's a lot of people. And if they face barriers in entering the workforce, then we all miss out on benefiting, on benefiting from their skills and talents, while they equally miss out on the fundamental human right to work and achieve autonomy and independence. Bankwest has taken steps to remove some of these barriers through initiatives such as its dedicated neurodiversity resource hub to support building awareness of neurodiversity and break down potential barriers and perceptions. We have several neuro neurodivergent colleagues in our Bankwest technology team, and we've seen a significant contribution and contributions that they make day to day, delivering amazing work, often on detailed code or processes. A diverse city of thought and a workforce that reflects Australian community ensures we are best placed to provide the best and most appropriate support for our customers. As BankWIS continues its evolution as a digital bank, delivering a banking experience that is accessible as possible for all, cust all customers is critical. I congratulate and thank Professor Mike Dockery, Principal Research Fellow, and Professor Alan Duncan, Director of the Bank West Curtin Economic Centre, for producing such an important report. I have no doubt that by the end of today's session, we will be equipped with some powerful insights that can inform us on how to ensure those millions of Australians with a disability are enabled to contribute to the country's workforce to their full capacity, something that benefits us all. Thank you. Over to you, Sam. Thank you very much, Roger, for those introductory remarks. Um, I'd like to now introduce Alan Duncan, Professor Alan Duncan, Director of Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre, and the report co-author Mike Dockery, who's the Principal Research Fellow at the Centre to give today's presentation of the research findings. So over to you, Alan and Mike. Thank you, Sam. Um, uh, we also acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Magic people of the Nona Nation and we pay our respects to their elders and senior knowledge holders, past, present and emerging. We also extend our respects to the traditional owners on the lands from which you're all joining us today. Before we uh, start, um, we'd like to acknowledge and thank our co-authors uh, uh, on this report as well as the amazing professional uh, team from the CEC. He ranges from around 60 to... Uh, I'm an older white man with freckles and very little hair. And I'm Mike, he, him, an even older white man. Uh, you're a typical nerdy economist with glasses and reddish hair. So tackling inequality has been in the centre's DNA uh, since our inception. Um, our 2022 Bridging the Gap on skill shortages revealed the high degree of labour market underutilisation of people with disabilities and penalty for people with a profound. And while the economic cost from this waste of talent is substantial, the exclusion of people from meaningful work uh, is by far the greater concern. And it's this wider story of labour market engagement for people with disability that motivates the report we're launching today. How inclusive of our workplaces? Should we be doing better? And if so, what needs to be done? People with disabilities lead full and rewarding lives. They make significant contributions to our economy and society, and they enrich the lives of those around them. And there's no doubt that our society is more accommodating of the rights and potential of people with disabilities than it once was. The report analyzes progress through a period of substantial policy overhaul, and particularly the transition to the so-called rights-based Starting with the Disability Services Act of 1986, we've seen a series of landmark policy changes relating to the rights, the employment conditions, and the level of funding to support people with disabilities. These culminated in the establishment of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which now supports over 600,000 participants with funding of 35 billion per year and growing. And yet, by one measure, only 53% of working age Australians with a disability were employed in 2022. That's 28.6 percentage points lower than for Australians without the disability. I say by one measure because different sources of data vary considerably 
in the way they identify people with disabilities. And this means that estimates of disability prevalence and other outcomes related to people with disability also vary. The 2021 census comes up with a measure of 3.5% of working age Australians who self-reported disability, but most professionals regard this as a severe underestimate. The 2018 Survey of Disability Aging and Carers uses detailed assessment criteria and assesses 14.3% of the population to have some form of disability, while the Household Income and Labor Dynamics in Australia survey, the HILDA survey, records an incidence of 17.2% of people with a specific restriction or limitation in 2022. The important point to note is that the findings in this report have been tested with detailed modeling and are consistent across alternative data sets and definitions. Using data from the Survey of Disability, Aging and Carers, we find an overall drop in the share of working age Australians with a disability from 18% in 1998 to 14.4% in 2018. The drop has been mainly due to the lower incidence of disability among men and women aged 45 to 69, while the incidence among the younger cohorts has remained relatively constant. As a result, the age gradient in the incidence of disability has become less steep. The HILDA data, data set is more up to date and covers the period between 2001 to 22. HILDA is also a panel data set, which means we can follow the same people over time. We use HILDA to look at the prevalence of disability for individual cohorts, starting with the builder generation, now age 75 and over, through to the baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, and the most recent Gen Z cohort, born after 1997. We again find a rising disability prevalence for each cohort as they age. But there is a markedly higher rate of disability for the recent Generation Z from ages 15 to 24 compared to those earlier cohorts at the same age. And that's particularly the case among women. It remains true for men, but to a slightly lesser extent. The probability of being in employment is lower for people with a disability and drops off for people with more severe limitations. While that might, may come as no surprise, the important thing to note is how little things have improved. We saw a slight increase in employment rates for Australians without a disability, but either stagnant or declining rate of employment for people with a disability, irrespective of the level of restriction. Now, the lack of progress in employment outcomes for people with disability could be affected by other factors, like the change in composition of the population in terms of severity of disability, age, educational attainment. So for this report, we use statistical regression models to see whether the same patterns apply, even when we take account of those compositional changes. And we find they do. Having a disability reduces a person's chance of being in a job by over 25 percentage points compared to a person without a disability. Even when we control for a wide range of characteristics, and we get the same result whether we use the SDAC survey or the Hilda survey. The general trend is one of no consistent improvement in labour market two decades. The same key finding is confirmed when we look separately at employment penalties for people with different levels of restriction. The raw employment penalty ranges from around 60 percentage point penalty for people with a profound core limitation to less than a five percentage point reduction for those with a long-term health condition but no core restriction. But more importantly we find there is we find there to be little difference in employment penalty when we account for differences in other characteristics with and without a disability. This tells us that the employment penalty is directly linked to disability status. Alan. Thanks, Mike. Uh, labour market inclusion doesn't end with being classified as employed. As many stakeholders stress to us, there's a huge difference between the workplace being physically accessible and a person with disability feeling genuinely included and a valued part of the team. Employment is far more precarious for people with disability. Panel data allows us to track people's labour market trajectories over time. Typically, 90% of workers without disability are in full-time employment in one year will still be in full-time work the following year, and less than 4% will be out of work. But among full-time workers with a disability, just 75% will still be in full-time work one year later, and over 11% won't be working at all. As a major research innovation, we explore the extent of churn experienced by people with disabilities by tracking 
the labour force status of the same people over an eight year window between 2015 and 2022. The people with disability, almost 60% remained out of the labour force for each of those eight years. For people without the disability, the largest share, around 40%, were in full-time employment in every year. And we also look at common labour force transitions over the eight-year period. And what stands out are the far higher shares of people with disability who move between work and either unemployment or non-participation. And this contrasts strongly with the labour market transitions of people without disability, where the shifts are mainly between full-time and part-time work. And when in employment, people with disability are more likely to be working fewer hours than they'd like. A far higher share of people with a work-limiting disability are underemployed over the past two decades, reaching as high as 20% of workers. And the underemployment gap compared to people without disability has, if anything, increased over time, peaking at a full 10 percentage points in 2019. Among people with disability, we find underemployment to be far more prevalent for women than men. So what does this all mean for job satisfaction for people with disability? Well, once in employment, people with disability are really quite content with their jobs. On a scale of zero to 10, they report average satisfaction ratings of 7.5, not far below workers without a disability. And people with disability are typically generally satisfied with the work they do and their flexibility. But satisfaction really diverges uh, when it comes to pay. And as we foreshadowed earlier in the analysis, people with disability report lower satisfaction with their job security and the hours they work. We also looked at what people with disability feel are the main barriers to finding work. And not surprisingly, almost 60% report their own ill health or disability as their main barrier to finding work. Other common barriers for job seekers are transport problems and being seen by employers as either too young or too old. Now, in recent Waves of Hilda, people were asked about their experiences of discrimination and specifically if they'd been discriminated against on the grounds of having a disability. More than a fifth of people with a work limiting disability felt they had missed out on the job because of discrimination. And half of those attributed this specifically to discrimination on grounds of disability. In comparison, just one in 11 applicants without a disability believe they'd missed out on the job because of discrimination. While the focus of this report is on labour market inclusion and whether this has improved over time, ultimately our interest is in how this contributes to the wider quality of life for Australians with disability. Again, it is important to stress that people with disability lead happy and rewarding lives. People with a worth limiting disability report an average rating with satisfaction with their life as a whole, 7.1 out of 10. But there is a life satisfaction gap between those with and without disabilities. These are most pronounced in the domains of health, job opportunities and finances, which highlights the importance of labour market inclusion. If anything, that satisfaction gap has widened since Hilda began collecting data in 2001. Again, these raw differences may be affected by other changes in the population. So we've conducted detailed modelling to control for these other factors. Some findings from these so-called happiness models are, first, having a disability is associated with reduced wellbeing, and that loss of wellbeing increases with the extent of limitation. Second, that reduction in wellbeing felt by people with disabilities and with each given level of limitation has increased since the beginning of this century, not reduced. Finally, we find that access to work does improve the wellbeing of Australians with disability. It's hard to prove that being in work has a causal effect on wellbeing. Could it be just that happier people are more likely to be employed? Well, using panel data, we can model how wellbeing changes for the same people as they move in and out of employment. Our results show a large positive effect of being in a job for people with a disability. A new report also looks at outcomes for people who care for a person who needs assistance because of a disability or old age. Around 1.4 million people in 2022. The majority of these, about 840,000, consider themselves to be the main or primary carer. Women take on the bulk of caring duties. 63% of carers are women, and this increases to 70% main carers. We estimate that taking on the primary carer role reduces a person's 
probability of being in employment by about 8.5 percentage points. When in work, carers report high job satisfaction. In fact, main carers have higher overall job satisfaction than people without caring roles. Main carers are particularly satisfied with the work they do, with the hours they work, and flexibility to balance work and non-work commitments. There's job security and pay that they are less satisfied with relative to other workers. We also observe a reduction in life satisfaction associated with the challenges of caring roles. Primary carers report lower satisfaction in the domains of employment opportunity and financial situation and the amount of, time for, the amount of free time they have. They also report much lower satisfaction with their health. In fact, there is a very large overlap between the population of carers with people and people with a disability. We find that 35% of main carers themselves have a work limiting disability, compared to 15% of people without caring roles. Our modelling shows a negative and significant effect on life satisfaction from being a main carer, but a much smaller penalty from other caring roles. In terms of the effects of labour market engagement on wellbeing of main carers, we find a positive effect associated with being in employment or in full-time education, one that more than offsets the wellbeing penalty associated with that caring role. The effects of caring roles on both employment opportunity and non-wellbeing appear to have been quite stable since 2005. So, progress on employment for people with disability is stagnated. Yet all major policy statements and strategies make clear that access to meaningful work is critical to full social participation. Our research provides strong evidence that employment does enhance the overall well-being of people with disabilities. And so what do we need to do to shift the dial? We believe that enhancing labour market inclusion is essential, and we advocate for the adoption of a work first. From previous studies and from our own stakeholder consultations, we hear of conflicting incentives within current support systems. Some specific criticisms of existing measures include a focus on compliance and short-term outcomes for employment service providers rather than longer-term outcomes. Minimum hours for placements that restrict progressive capacity building and maximum hours and earnings thresholds that threaten people's eligibility to support them. Policy settings need to be aligned towards achieving positive employment is far more precarious rather than creating adverse incentives. And policy designs also need to be refined and coordinated through evaluation and evidence on what works best in combination rather than set arbitrarily and in isolation of people with disability. Panel data. We estimate that increasing the number of people with a disability in employment by just 10% would boost national output by $16 billion per annum. And this ignores savings in welfare payments and in other supports. The default assumption should be that people with disability can access meaningful work whenever they and their families believe it appropriate. And yet, analysis of recent NDIS reporting data reveals that only around one third of support plans for working age clients include any employment goals. The HILDA data started to identify NDIS participants from 2017, and this allows us to test the effect of participation in the scheme. After accounting for a person's level of restrictions and other factors, we find that having an NDIS support package actually reduces the probability of participating in the labour market or being in employment. For some clients who find holding down a job challenging, this may be because access to NDIS support reduces the need for work. But even when we focus on people who aren't in a job but would ideally like to have a job, we estimate that having an NDIS support package is associated with a 7% reduction in the chance of getting a job in the following year. There is a clear case for more focus on educational attainment and on the education to work transition for young people with disability. Educational attainment has increased for people with disability, but not as much as for the general population. For example, the gap in shares of people with and without disability achieving university qualifications has now widened to over 10 percentage points. The education to work transition is crucial, and our report highlights just how transformative tertiary education uh, can be in broadening access to employment. 
We find that having a bachelor's degree removes entirely the employment penalty for people with disability compared to people without disability. And yet it's hard to reconcile the stated aims of the recently released universities accord with these findings. The accord commits to broadening access to education for underrepresented groups with targets to raise by 2035 the shares of students from regional, rural and remote areas and from First Nations and lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And yet, the ambitions for people with disability under the Accord are to maintain rather than expand participation rates. And less than 4%, the government's commitments to broadening access to education for people with disability are, are out of step and they need to be strengthened. So taking stock of what we've just heard, it seems almost irreconcilable that after decades of major policy reforms, all aimed at enhancing the rights and the social inclusion of people with disabilities, along with a very substantial increase in the level of funding for supports and services. We find no evidence of any improvement in labour market inclusion or relative wellbeing of Australians with a disability or for their carers. We fully support the rights-based approach to disability policy, but this alone isn't generating sufficient momentum. Despite the best intentions of policymakers and the many organisations in the sector, too many people with a disability are still excluded from our workplaces, the opportunity to contribute socially and economically. Even when people with disability are in work, their jobs are often too insecure, poorly paid, and they struggle to find working hours that meet their needs. They feel they are discriminated against in applying for work and in the workplace far more often than other people. The report we are releasing today contains many recommendations. As Alan has alluded to, a key one is to adopt a work first, a work first approach to policy and service delivery based on the universal right to meaningful work. To achieve this, we propose the establishment of a body to coordinate all aspects of policy relating to employment for people with a disability, a National Disability Employment Agency. Critical to this work first approach is to mobilise the goodwill and the capacity of the corporate sector. Research indicates businesses are often reluctant to take on employees with disability for a number of reasons. Full -time work on they don't know where to start. They perceive complexity in dealing with multiple agencies. They are unsure about costs or overestimate costs. The proposed agency would address these barriers by linking employers, service provider and employees in aligning policy settings. We propose enhanced funding support for employers for workplace adjustments. In this environment, we see all employers as Australian disability enterprises. Workers should be paid at least minimum or award wages, with wage subsidies making up any shortfall between wages and productivity. Payments to firms would be based on outcomes, with waiting on long-term outcomes and improvements in self-determination, feelings of inclusiveness and meaningful work. Policy settings would be refined over time through evaluation and identification of best practice. Raising educational attainment and education to work transitions are both critical and early intervention is the key. We need to catch people early to try to avoid their dis disengagement with the labour market. And the public sector needs to show more leadership. There has been slow progress against targets and inconsistent planning and reporting across jurisdictions. When we mention the failure of policy reforms to address labour market exclusion for people with disabilities, much of the explanation lies at the same point that has been made many times before. Changing attitudes is the key. Changing the attitudes of employers, of employees and the community and instilling in the mindset of policymakers and service providers that access to meaningful work is a right. We provide clear evidence that addressing labour market exclusion would enhance the lives of people with disabilities the lives of their families and carers and enhance our broader society. Policies and actions need to recognise people's capabilities and potential, not their perceived limitations. The economic return is massive, but this shouldn't be about an economic return. This is far more about recognising the right of people with disability to live with dignity and to, and to participate to the fullest extent possible in society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan and Mike, for those really insightful remarks. Um, there's some very interesting findings there, and I really like how you've looked at both the economic implications, but also people's feelings of well-being and satisfaction with life. 
when you think about the vast majority of um, the adult population, having a job and working is a major part of life. It provides not only income to live, to save for holidays or housing, all those important things, but also work is often the place where we find purpose. And be. And 2022. It's really great to see those things all part of that research and the findings. I'm sure the panel will also have a lot to comment on the findings as well. So I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, I know that there are some questions coming up in the chat and um, for some questions where there's asking for clarification on things in the report, we'll have Mike Dockery staying on to be on the panel with us for those questions as well. Our first panellist, and I'll just ask if panel members could give a little wave as I introduce them, and then the first time that you speak, if you could uh, say who you are and a little brief description of yourself. So our first panellist for today is Anika Boat, who's the Communications Coordinator with the Youth Disability Advocacy Network. Hi, Anika. Anika is a proud and bold disability and care advocate and they had the privilege of growing up in the disabled community and have been heavily involved with wheelchair basketball and in later years, coaching wheelchair basketball for children. I'd also like to introduce Michelle Silva. Michelle is the chairperson of the uh, Advisory Council for Developmental Disability, WA. The Advisory Council provides some valuable insights and guides on the work carried out at Developmental Disability WA to help better serve the community. And Michelle also works part-time at Containers for Change and in her free time is a keen tenpin bowler, having previously represented WA at the Special Olympics in this event. Congratulations, Michelle. We also have Siobhan Turney, who's our third panellist today. Siobhan is the Director of Includability an initiative led by the Australian Human Rights Commission that aims to increase meaningful employment opportunities for people with disability. So this will be of particular interest for Siobhan. Um, prior to this, Siobhan directed a policy team at the Disability Royal Commission that developed the inquiry's findings and recommendations on addressing the barriers to employment faced by people with disability. And our fourth panellist today is Jeff Pratt. Jeff Trappett, OAM. Hi, Jeff. Jeff is a former Paralympic athlete, gold medalist and world record holder. But following on from sport, Jeff has transitioned to working professionally in multiple senior executive roles within the disability sector and is now two years into the role of disability lead at Woolworths Group and ensuring that the lens of disability inclusion is across all that they do for both the team and customer. And as I said before, we have Mike Dockery also on the panel to help with clarifying some of the research report findings. So thank you to all our panellists for joining us today. Um, and I know people can please start putting some questions in the chat. Um, I am going to start by firstly, um, just before I come to you, Michelle, I might just ask Mike to address one of the questions that's come up in the chat, just to, to unpack what is meant by work limiting, work limiting disability in the report. Yes, so there's a, as we pointed out, there's a number of different data sets and they all have different measures and different definitions. Um, so the thing we really wanted to highlight is whatever definition you choose, our results hold. So that's whether we use the, the SDAC, Survey of Disability Aging and Carers, or ILDA. So the SDAC has quite um, you know, detailed measures of um, ex extent of limitation, and it goes through from, from mild through to profound. And that depends on the, mainly based on the amount of assistance you need with core activities like communication and, and um, self-help and, and mobility. With the HILDA data, we've got a number of questions. One is just, do you have a disability? And if people answer yes, and then ask, does this dis disability um, restrict the amount or type of work you can do? So that's what we've called, if they say yes to that, that's what we've called a work-limiting disability. But there's actually more detailed data in HILDA. You're then asked to assess on a scale from zero to 10, the extent to which this limits the amount of work you can do. 
too, where zero is not at all through to 10 is I can't work at all. So we've got some pretty, you know, granular measurements that we can look to see whether there's been any improvement over time by different measures of discipline. Thanks very much for that, Mike. So I'm going to start though now with a question for Michelle. And Michelle, you've had a few different jobs and had support sometimes to find work as a disabled person. Can you tell us about your experience finding work and what your current job's like? What do you like and what's challenging with that work? Um, yes, thank you, Sam. Um, um, as you all know, I I'm a person with a disability. I have an intellectual disability. Um, and it was hard getting a job that I liked to do. Um, that's very important. I worked, I worked in a few other jobs first to try and work out what exactly I would like to do. I think that is a good thing to try different jobs before you decide what is going to work for you. Thank you. That is really interesting. I think that came up in the report as well. And um, I'm, I'm, I know we're starting to get some questions. I'm going to just ask Anika, Anika, sorry, Anika. Um, Anika. Thank you. The report has got a bit to say about the support needed in school and um, what support can be given to young people with disabilities to, get, to really build those foundations for employment. So what did you think about the findings and the recommendations around that transition process and specialised career supports? Um, I, I have to be completely honest that it was quite depressing to know where the rest of my peer group is at currently um, because, you know, we all want to believe that we've had our own personal struggles, but knowing it's a shared thing across my community is a bit, uh, but I, the idea of implementing at year nine is something that I absolutely adore. I think we don't discuss with young people with disabilities what even them having a job. I never... I think a lot of young people with disabilities never get asked what's your dream job or anything like that. So even starting the conversation within themselves, within their peer group of, oh, I can have a job, what does that look like? That'll start the train thought of how do we lead to what's a reasonable adjustment? How can I ask for a reasonable adjustment? And I think targeting at a young age group, especially as the rest of their peers are starting to talk about part-time jobs, makes them both feel included, but also can do a whole ton for representation across the whole sector. Thanks, Annika. I can see that we've got some questions coming up in the chat there. There's um, a question there around uh, social enterprises and how effective they are. Um, I'm wondering, um, Siobhan, could you tell us a little bit about um, that recommendation of the National Disability Employment Agency? And because there's a couple of questions that are coming up in the chat about um, implementing different work designs, um, some of the things with policies of Fair Work Australia. Um, what do you think about some of those sorts of recommendations and how we can make some change in that space, given your experience with the Human Rights Commission and the Disability World Commission? Thanks, Sam. I'd love to take that question. Uh, before I dive into it, I would just like to acknowledge that I'm joining you all from the lands of the Gadigal people, the Eora Nation in Sydney, and just provide a brief image description. I'm a woman in my 30s with brown hair and freckles, and I am wearing a shirt with telephones printed on it. Uh, so I would really love to commend uh, the Bank West Curtin Economic Centre for this very comprehensive analysis and some of the really interesting insights and recommendations they've put forward. The one about a national disability employment agency definitely caught my attention because I strongly agree with the point made in the report that there is a real proliferation of employment services, both mainstream, by which I mean non-disability specific and disability specific, different types of so social security, income support and initiatives at both the federal and state level, as well as a really complex legislative framework around employment rights and anti-discrimination laws. So we've got a really complex environment here. And it's very difficult for both employers and employees to navigate. And the other thing that's obviously been addressed in, in this report is the lack of progress, the stagnation in improvement of employment levels for people with disability. So I definitely see there being a role for a centralised coordinating point that really promotes best practice. 
Uh, and I would note that the current federal government, as part of its uh, election commitments in the most recent election, committed to creating a national disability employment center of excellence. And I believe they're currently in the process of developing that, which I think could in part serve to, to take up some of the functions that this report has suggested in terms of encouraging better data collection, promoting the kind of models that might look like best practice. And so that goes to that question around social enterprises. We've seen a lot of different uh, models put forward as, as, as the way that could in assist in improving the employment of people with disability. And I think social enterprises represent a really interesting example of that. They are more flexible, more agile. I guess there's a lot of diversity in what social enterprises look like, and there's not a consistent de definition of what social enterprises are. So I think there's more work for social enterprises to play in this space, but I think we need uh, a more central national body that is going to help guide people in, in trying to discover what best practice really looks like that is going to shift the dial. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, that's really interesting that the federal government's sort of doing something similar. Let's hope they're having a look at this report as well. Um, I'm going to go to Jeff. Um, Jeff, you're working with a very large corporate organisation, um, the retail industry, a big employer. Um, with the idea of your first best approach, um, what do you think about that? What's worked in Woolworths, and in fact, can work in large organisations. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. Um, first and first and foremost, um, coming to you from uh, Gadigal land, uh, and acknowledge their acknowledge their sovereignty of the land here. Um, I'm a middle-aged man um, wearing a purple shirt, um, slightly graying hair, uh, slightly receding hair, sadly enough. Also, um, also. I just want to pick up on the social enterprise um, element and um, and I will get around to your question. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done at Woolworths Group in our includability program um, uh, project that we did in WA, uh, where we brought a number of people over onto, uh, over from supported wage into an award wage role or an EA um, role. Uh, and what we discovered is that Along uh, would be a similar would be a similar vein of social enterprise that the supported wage role um, that they were previously in was the only one that was ever offered to them, so they never actually had a chance to to prove themselves um, in an award wage role, um, and I think that's a really important part um, of self determination for people with disabilities to be given. The, is to be given those options and be given the the opportunities um, in those in those same options as uh, as the broader community. Because what we saw is um, we we ended up employing twelve out of the fifteen people. Um, that tells me um, that those twelve people was supported wage the right place for them to be put. Um, in the in the first place, you would have to question that. I would think so. Um, choice and control is actually a um, uh, is actually a large part of employment as well, um, which I don't think we explore we explore well enough. Mm, thank you for that, Jeff. That's really interesting. We've got a um, a question in the chat there, which I might um, ask Mike to come back to. So a question around whether the report addresses the difference between intellectual disability and physical disability. So if there's any difference around relative employment participation. But I'm also going to address the elephant in the room, so to speak, and ask Mike, um, you did also talk about in the report, uh, Australian, you know, every business should be an Australian disability enterprise. And whether you could just unpack that a bit from the report's perspective of um, your findings. Um, yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, we haven't. There is some some data on on trends in um, physical disabilities and intellectual disabilities, and it seems what's happened over time is that um, the number of people, and particularly older people with physical disabilities, has has declined, um, while general um, um, other disabilities have stayed pretty well stable, or, or some gone up, particularly in younger groups. But most of the, the data that we're working with when we try to control for the, the sort of the extent of limitation, that data doesn't distinguish necessarily, it just distinguishes on, on the, the length 
the extent of the restrictions in terms of your core functionings around communication and, and mobility and whether you need assistance either occasionally or whether you always need assistance. So in, in a sense, the, the level of, of restriction doesn't distinguish, but we do have some data on that. On, that. Um, on the um, Australian Disability Enterprises was the second question. Um, yeah, so in, in the, the way we see the policy that we're advocating, basically, as long as you've got the supports and subsidies and, and so on, and they're aligned to good, to well so what, and it shouldn't just be whether you're in work or out, out of work, it should be about meaningful work and whether this is contributing to people's sense of self-determination and, and their well-being and, and whether they're feeling they're in a, in a meaningful job. So as long as we're measuring those outcomes, then we're saying, well, whether you're a, a, um, a sort of more segregated or, or Australian disability enterprise or whether you're Woolworths or, or whatever you are, what's critical is for the money that, that we're putting in or that the, the government or the policy would be putting in, what are you getting out in terms of outcomes that are aligned with improving the lives of people with disabilities? And we're saying, well, you know, we, we don't care if, if you're improving, you know, we, I know there's, um, you know, a lot of um, quite staunch and very good. Well, once, as long as you're improving the lives of people with disability, that's where the funding should go. And the evidence suggests, or the literature suggests that actually um, open employment is cheaper. People who place people with disabilities in open employment is cheaper. And if that's the case, then in the long run, um, some of the, the segregated enterprises might, you know, might just become, you know, not cost effective in relation to those other organisations. But what we're saying, we want to increase in employment and we want to increase in wellbeing. And, you know, if you're providing that, we think you should be supported. Thank you. I think that's very much sort of summing up that work first approach that you're talking about there as well. Um, Siobhan, you've got your hand up there. I'm going to, um, any of the panel members, if you want to add to some discussion, please just pop your hand. Zero to 10. There. And then I'll follow that with Jeff. Thanks, Sam. I just wanted to build on what Mike was saying that I think it's a great question that's important to acknowledge that people with disability as a cohort are not a uniform group. And I think we do have, and again, I'm not the data boffin, so please don't quote me on this, but I think we do have some statistics, I think through the Survey of Disability Aging Carers, that uh, we know that people with intellectual disability, cognitive disability and psychosocial disability have much lower representation in workforce participation, uh, which I think is you know, an important point to bear in mind. And in terms of, um, the other point that Mike was making, I think this, one of the really interesting strengths of this report is that uh, looking at work first approach that is very embedded in the US policy and legislative space. In the US, they have something called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, where they've really embedded a focus on customised employment as a policy and legislative preference. And that means where employment services are offered to a person with disability, it is that idea that everyone who can and what Everyone who wants to work can work and right, with the work they do and their flexibility. Competitive employment, which means at full award wages. And this is happening at the national level in the US and at various states, they've really taken that forward in the way that they've structured employment service delivery, which I think is a really interesting approach in terms of making sure that everyone has the opportunity to work in a range of different workplaces, no matter what their work limitation might be. Um, so I'll pause there. That was just what I was going to add to what Mike was saying. No, I think Siobhan, really great point. And I think the report does talk really about divergence. Uh, uh, agency being able to look at where best practice excellence is happening. I'm going to go to Jeff, and then after Jeff, I might ask a question of Michelle and then go to uh, Annika for a question. Thank you. Um, just wanted to build on um, a term that we use um, with our broader workforce is meaningful employment or meaningful hours. Um, and I really think that that's a that's an area of research that we need to dig into when it comes to people with disability. Is our is a person with a disability's interpretation of meaningful work and meaningful hours um, similar or different um, than the broader population? Does it change within uh, Does it change within disability cohorts? I think they're really important conversations so that we know that we're 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 judging a person's um, Ability work, ability to work, and their amount of work to what they feel as being meaningful work. Um, I think that's really important for us to do some research research on and make sure our assumptions are right there. 
Absolutely. Great point, Jeff. Personally, I'm all for a four-day week. Um, um, Michelle, I'm just wondering, because you're part of that Advisory Council for Developmental Disability WA, and there's lots of ideas being talked about here, what is it that do you think other people with intellectual disability that you know say about finding and keeping work? We all... Some other people with intellectual disability have told us some of the things that they find hard about work. And this includes managing conflict or disagreements with other workmates, being able to stay focused on tasks, having lots of brain breaks helps with this. Managing health appointments and having a job is sometimes very tricky. Finding jobs is sometimes the easy bit. It keeps, it's keeping that job that can be very hard. Having the right supports at work makes all the difference. Feeling like you are, are included in your workplace is very important. Owning my own micro business, for example, the coffee cart business, allows me to be really flexible and work the hours that suits me. Having nice workmates, having a boss who is a good communicator, who checks in with us and is patient, having a boss who is willing to have the main barrier to finding work, patience about the work we can do. And also, um, what I like about my work is I like that my job allows me to meet new people. I like I like that I have work colleagues we sometimes meet outside of work. I like everyone else. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I really get in my pay every fortnight. And having a job has given me a purpose in life. And it feels really good to be included in a workplace that's very important as well. Mm. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think you've really highlighted a couple of the things which have come out in the report about that, you know, an inclusive and an accessible and a welcoming workplace actually really makes a difference. And I mean, you can see that when you look. Now, in recent ways of who anonymously will say they have a disability versus you know, when people don't want to say they have a disability in the workplace because they feel they might lose some of that um, inclusivity and accessibility as well. Um, Annika, there's a question in the chat there about supporting young people with disability to get their first job, um, whether it's as an after-school job or something like that. What are your thoughts or the experience of young people? With, um, I have a couple. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a couple thoughts and thank you for the reminder. I will just do a quick visual description of myself. So I'm a young white person wearing a flowery halter neck top. I have white, blonde, fluffy hair and I have a couple of tattoos and silver piercings and jewellery all over. Um, so what, some of my thoughts about how young people can gain employment after school, I think it's sort of a two part situation because when young if people have the ability to get a job during school i think that's the most important factor because at least in my experience and everyone that i was raised around in the disabled community we're going into a situation where everyone else we're competing with have all had jobs for the last couple of years and we're all going to get paid the same youth amount you know so why logically why would they employ someone who's going to have more issues more adjustments when you've got someone who's already got work experience, already knows what's happening, don't have to make any adjustments for. So I think one of the key things is encouraging young people to get jobs during school um, and really making a focus that I see so many young people with disabilities get pushed, forced in my opinion, towards a lot of volunteer roles because their carers around them want them to have experience. And that's okay. However, it does create a mindset that they're not worth it. And I see that over and over again. They don't chase lucrative careers. They don't chase the money because they've never been example that they're worthy of chasing money. So I think a key aspect is getting them employment during school to get that experience, not just volunteers, 
volunteer experience, but paid work experience. And then if you're going for a young person to gain employment after school, we really need to equip them with what are your rights in the workplace? What can you stand up for? And not only teach them the rights that they have within employment, but how to advocate for them, how to talk about them and having the confidence to speak up. You know, a lot of disabled people were taught constantly to shut ourselves down, to not complain, to not be too big, because we don't want to be seen as the sad little disabled person. Without a disability, believe. And teaching people how to do that in an ethical, considerate and legal way, I think can be a massive key within that. Thank you so much for that. I think that um, is a highlight in your report as well around that whole idea. You know, once you've got work, it's actually easier then to keep getting work. Um, mm -hmm. And who hasn't, well, Many people with disabilities unfortunately haven't, but I'm looking at Jeff's hand up because a lot of those first jobs are in the retail sector. Jeff, you wanted to add something? Yes, we certainly do specialise in those kind of, in those kinds of jobs, Samantha. Funnily enough, um, just building on the building on the volunteering aspect, um, it's it's also for me not just volunteering but work experience. Um, we sadly do see um, a lot of circular focus on labour market inclusion brought about through through funding and policy um, regulation with uh, with employment providers that tend to to have people with a disability on a on a circular path of work experience um, forever it can seem at times and we need to make sure that we don't have any perverse policy um, and funding instruments which um, which promote that as an as a as an only our interest is in how this kind of person is job ready um, is yeah something that I think we need to we need to strive towards as soon as that person is job ready in the same way that um, any employer would be taking a risk on on employing any kind any school kid um, for example you don't know whether they're going to work out um, realistically um, it, the same level of risk um, should be um, should be taken when it comes to a person with a disability no more no less. Mm. And again, I'm just noting that that sort of coming back to that whole idea of um, if we've got the data around what subsidies work, what the incentives are, do they work, what's the outcomes, um, to actually build good policy on that evidence base, um, which is coming through very strongly in the report. Now, we have a question in the chat there around lead happy and rewarding. seeing the number of people with disabilities applying for government jobs, um, government applications. And the report talks a little bit about public sector. Lives. People with a work list. Just um, I'll open it up for anyone in the panel that might have any thoughts on that. Maybe Siobhan, as someone who's working in the Australian Human Rights Commission, one of the public service agencies, you might want to have a go at that one. For sure, I'll jump in onto that one. Uh, I think there's lots of things that can be done in this space. And I think there are some things that already have been shown to work well to a degree. So, for example, at the Australian Commonwealth Public Service, there is a, a scheme called the Recruitability Scheme, which is a particular uh, scheme which allows people with disability to opt in if they choose to, and if they are considered as meeting the baseline selection criteria in their application, that they can progress an extra step forward in uh, the recruitment process. So that might mean instead of having to do a written assessment that they can go straight to interview. And so that's a kind of uh, positive affirmative measure that can really uh, encourage people with disability to apply because it's showing that their employer is very interested in their application. I think there's a lot more to be done for all organisations, but Govern particularly as, you know, a, an area, a sector that tries to model itself as an employer of choice and, at both the federal and state level is always seeking to be representative of the population that it is serving, there's a lot of steps that they can take to be more proactive in showing that they want to increase their disability representation. The report touches on the fact that various states and territories do have employment targets for people with disability. Some are more ambitious than others. Some are more likely to be achieved than others. I think the report notes that but there is a life satisfaction gap is to actually reach their targets. So I think there's further thinking that all public services can do and then the agencies within those services, public services can do to promote the employment of people with disability. Because, again, we see within a public service, different agencies have much higher levels of representation of people with disability than others. And I think there's a lot of unpacking that needs to be done there as to why that might be. Um, oh, I could keep going, but I'm going to draw a breath and let others jump in if they wish. 
Any other panel members, any comments on what uh, we might be able to see the public sector do as a, as a leader in this space? I'll just add that, in my view, it, this has always been a role of the public sector to be a leader in, in sort of employment conditions, whether it's parental leave or gender equality. In past days, they were the main source of apprentices in a lot of industries, and um, so they have that important role. And the public sector can take on risks and uncertainties and try new things for a, a particularly a small business or the corporate sector. If you try these things and they go wrong, then there's a very high risk. That risk isn't there for the public sector. They can do it. It's a budgetary issue. Most of the outcomes is going to be a budgetary offset anyway. Um, you know, they, they employ certain people or train certain people. So I really think it's a, a legitimate role and, and the public sector should be doing more. Thanks, Mike. Siobhan, add to Just that one. One more thing I wanted to add, which was linking back to the previous question about job pathways for people with disability leaving school and going into employment. Again, I see the public sector as having a really important role to play there. And I think there are some states, I think Victoria is the one that springs to mind, where they've set up particular graduate streams that have a disability specific pathway. So it's a really great way of getting young people with disability finances which highlights the importance go, uh, and getting that work experience so that you don't have that cycle of being stuck in volunteering or unpaid work experience. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask, we've got a question about best practice inclusive recruitment. Um, and I might, uh, if that's okay, uh, start with Annika, if there's anything about recruitment practices that you've experienced or that young people are seeing that you'd like to highlight? Um, one of the main aspects of recruitment practices that I've seen is that for me, I have a little bit of a diverse disability. So I have a psychosocial disability and a physical disability that makes me an ambulatory wheelchair user and a prosthetic user. And in I've personally been involved with um, non-disabled employment agencies, after school, um, sorry, transition after school employment. Uh, I think it's the Student Leavers Program and the uh, disabled employment services. And in all of these scenarios, I've been confronted with people that have little to no understanding of my disability or capabilities. And I think when people are in those experiences, they're already putting themselves to go, hey, I want a job to have to advocate for themselves, getting shut down by people that have absolutely no understanding, especially in these, of how disability looks for that individual. They constantly, in my experience, come to the scenario with closed ended questions. They don't allow us to work through and figure out what works best for us. And I think that can be a really damaging effect on the employment industry, in the disability employment sector as a whole, is those first people, first points of call, especially non disabled people, just don't seem to have enough training and understanding of the diversity and complexities of disability. Mm. Thanks, Annika. I'm going to go to Jeff. And Jeff, I wonder if you could also think about, um, as you know, a large organisation, one of the things the report talked about was what can we learn from things that have worked in other areas, such as the workforce gender equality models. Wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, did you do something differently with recruitment in Woolworths? Um, I'm yeah, sure. Know, um, and I'll just flag first. Having a disability. Your experience in um, interviews and recruiting as well after Jeff, if that's okay. A couple of things in the talent acquisition space. Um, first and foremost, um, very important for organisations to do uh, um, what I would call a barrier removal um, piece to examine their to examine their talent acquisition process. And that loss of wellbeing in person with a disability might come up against, um, for example. If you're following through your process and you see that you've got um, you've got any kind of video interviewing um, with a with a time accounting down, then you'd be thinking um, that might be a barrier to anyone with a with a that's deaf or hard of hearing, um, and also anyone who might identify as neurodiverse. So, um, doing a good thorough um, analysis of what barriers might might exist in your in your talent acquisition um, journey is absolutely key. And making sure that you're there, that you're engaging with good quality uh, service providers, peak bodies, advocacy organisations to to help you with that work um, uh, in a secret in a secret shopper um, context, if needed. 
um, for them to be uh, able to help walk you through, um, these are the barriers that these uh, that these particular cohorts um, found throughout the found throughout the journey. And really, that is what I've just described. There is exactly the same as you would do for many marginalised um, many marginalised communities. Um, a barrier removal piece um, is something that you could do for LGBTQ um, communities, something that you could do for gender, something that you do for First Nations. Um, the only difference is where you get the content knowledge from. Um, and obviously those of us in this room would say, would say you get that through um, good engagement with those with lived experience. Absolutely, talk to us for help out with that. Um, so Michelle, I just wondered if you wanted to share anything you've learned about when you had to apply for jobs and what that process was like. And then after Michelle, we'll have our final question. Um, yes, um, my job sorry, my job coordinator through Ability WA helped helped me to find my current job. And when I started, my supervisor worked out the jobs that I would would be doing. He spoke to me a lot first to see what tasks I would like to do and the things I was good at. We worked out together that I would be good at meeting people and carrying out tasks. My job is also very flexible, so if I need to take some time off to go to appointments or if I'm feeling overwhelmed at any stage, I can just let them know and it's okay to have some time off or a break. It feels good to work somewhere where you can be supported in your job. I know that I can talk to my supervisor if I'm if I'm finding anything difficult. Good communication is very important, and I have learned that it is always better to speak up about things rather than let things get worse. It feels really good to have a job. I like telling my family and friends that I am going off to work. It gives me a purpose in life and makes me feel really proud of myself. Thanks very much, Michelle. Again, fantastic insights into what can really work well for people. Um, I'm just going to go to our final question, which we have in the chat, which is about uh, carers and would having a flexible workplace be a disadvantage for workers or caregivers? Um, and I think this is this question about um, that income support part of it. I might just check in, Mike, first, if you've got anything that you wanted to clarify about that findings around carers before opening that up to anyone else? Oh, just definitely flexibility is really important. And you saw in that what people think about the, the quality of their life, the, the big difference for carers is the amount of free time they have. They're, they're really time stressed and it's really, it, it's a real struggle. Um, so that that is definitely important, very important. Um, yeah, the, the other thing I'll note is that, that when we look at um, I made the point about how many carers actually have a disability. So when in the Hilda data, when carers are asked about their barriers to getting a job, it's actually their own ill health rather than other family responsibility that is the bigger barrier. Um, so yeah, that's really important that we well, people in the sector that might um, who work in this area might be quite familiar with that. But that was a real shock to me. The, the, the number of people who are caring who also have a disability, or vice versa, the number of people with disability who are also undertake caring roles. Thank you. I'll just see if there's any other comment from panel members as we are sort of getting to the end of our time before we close this off. No? No, that's great. Look, I want to um, really thank everybody today for sending your questions in for those that have been attendees. Um, I would like to really a uh, big thanks to our panel members. So thank you, Michelle, uh, Annika, Siobhan, Jeff, and Mike. And of course, the wonderful report that we heard about from Mike and Alan as well, and the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre for doing this work. It's such an important topic. And when I think back to things like the Workplace Gender Equality Report, that's just been, you know, this year, the, it was names were out there in the public. Um, we have to be talking about these things and it's when an institution like the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre is doing this sort of work 
making it publicly available and talking about it. Let's hope that there's continued work and follow-up so um, that uh, awareness of where the gaps are can keep being there as well. And we might hopefully get the sort of shift we've seen in the workplace gender equality reports as well. But thank you very much, everyone. For being in it. Just a couple of final housekeeping things. The slides from today's event will be available on the website and will be shared by email from everybody that um, attended today. And you can download the full report now from the Bank West Curtin Economic Centre website, which is bcec.edu. And I'd again just thank everyone for their time today and we hope you have a lovely day. Thank you.